Chapter Fourteen of Savarine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bob Sage. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Savarine's Disappearance. Chapter Fourteen. The Bad Half Crown. He began by comparing himself to the bad half-crown, which always finds its way back, but which has no right to expect a warm welcome on its return. "'Were it not,' he said, "'that I feel myself to be pretty near the end of my earth's journey, I could not have the face to tell you my story at all. But I feel that I am worn out, and don't think it likely that I shall ever leave this room except for the grave. You shall know everything, even more fully than I have ever known it myself until within the last few hours. They say that when a man is nearing his end, he sees more clearly than at any other time of his life. For my part, I now see for the first time that I have never been anything but a worthless lout from my cradle. I have never been fit to walk alone, and if health and strength were to come back to me, I should not be one whit better than I have hitherto been. I don't know whether I ever told you that I have a streak of gypsy blood in my veins. My grandmother was a Romany, picked up by my grandfather on Wandsworth Common, I don't offer this fact as any excuse for my conduct, but I have sometimes thought that it may have something to do with the pronounced vagabondism which has always been one of my most distinctive features. So long as I was at home in my father's house, he kept me from doing anything very outrageous, but I was always a creature of impulse, ready to enter into any harebrained scheme without counting the cost, I never looked a week ahead in my life. It was sufficient for me if the present was endurable, and if the general outlook for the future promised something new. My coming to this country in the first place was a mere impulse, inspired by a senseless liking for adventure, and a wish to see strange faces and scenes. My taking Squire Harrington's farm was an impulse, very largely due to its proximity to Lapierre's, who was a jolly landlord and knows how to make his guests comfortable. I had no special aptitude for farm life, no special desire to get on in the world, no special desire to do anything except pass the time as pleasantly as I could, without thought or care for the future. And as I have fully made up my mind to make a clean breast of it, I am going to tell you something which will make you despise me more than you have ever despised me yet. When I married you, I did so from impulse. Don't mistake me. I liked you better than any other woman I had ever seen. I liked your pretty face and your gentle, girlish ways. I knew that you were good and would make an excellent wife. But I well knew that I had no such feeling toward you as a man should have towards the woman whom he intends to make the companion of his life. No such feeling, for instance, as I have for you at this moment. Well, I married you, and we lived together as happily as most young couples do. I knew that I had a good wife, and you didn't know or even suspect what a brainless, heartless clod you had for your husband. Our married life glided by without anything particular happening to disturb it, but the thing became monotonous to me. I had the senseless vagabond's desire for change. We did fairly well on the farm, but once or twice I was on the point of proposing to you that we should emigrate to the western states. I began to drink more than was good for me, and two or three times when I came home half seas over you reproached me 
and looked at me in a way I didn't like. This I inwardly resented like the besotted fool I was. It seemed to me that you might have held your tongue. The feeling wasn't a very strong one with me, and if it hadn't been for that cursed four hundred pounds, things might have gone on for some time longer. Of course, I kept all this to myself, for I was at least sensible enough to feel ashamed of my want of purpose, and knew that I deserved to be horsewhipped for not caring more for you and baby. The legacy from my father, if properly used, would have placed us on our feet. With a farm of my own, I might reasonably hope to become a man of more importance in our community than I had been. For a time this was the only side of the picture that presented itself to my mind. I began to contemplate myself as a landed proprietor, and the contemplation was pleasant enough. I bought the farm from Squire Harrington in good faith, and with no other intention than to carry out the transaction. When I left home on the morning of that 17th of July, I had no more intention of absconding than I now have of running for Parliament. The idea never so much as entered my mind. The morning was wet, and it seemed likely that we should have a rainy day. I was in a more loaferish mood than usual, and thought I might as well ride to town to pass the time. The hired man, whose name I have forgotten, was not within call at the moment, so I went out to the stable to saddle Black Bess for myself. Then I found that the inner front padding of the saddle had been torn by rats during the night, and that the metal plate was exposed. To use it in that state would have galled the mare's back, and it was necessary to place something beneath it. I looked about me in the stable, but saw nothing suitable, so I returned into the house to get some kind of an old cloth for the purpose. If you had been there, I should have asked for what I wanted, but you were not to be seen, and when I called out your name, you did not answer. Then in a fit of momentary stupid petulance, I went into the front bedroom, opened my trunk, and took out the first thing that came uppermost. I should have taken and used it for what I wanted just then, even if it had been a silk dress or a petticoat, but it happened to be a coat of my own. I took it out to the stable, placed it under the saddle, and rode off. Before reaching the front gate, I saw how it was that you had not answered my call, for as you doubtless remembered, you were in the orchard with baby in your arms at some distance from the house. I nodded to you as I rode past, little thinking that years would elapse before I should see you again. I suppose you know all about how I spent the day. I had a bit of a quarrel with the clerk at the bank, and that put me out of humor. I had not intended to draw the money, but to leave it on deposit till next morning. Shuttleworth's ill-tempered remarks nettled me. I took the notes in a huff and left the bank with them in my pocket. I ought to have sense enough to ride home at once, but I went to the peacock and muddled myself with drink. I felt elated to have such a large sum of money about me. I carried on like a fool and a sot all afternoon. I didn't start for home till a few minutes before dark. Up to that moment the idea of clearing out had never presented itself to my mind, but as I cantered along the quiet road, I began to think what a good time I could have with four hundred pounds in my pocket in some far-off place where I was not known, and where I should be free from encumbrances of every kind. In the half-befuddled condition in which I then was, the idea quickly took possession of my stupid imagination. I rode along, however, without coming to any fixed determination, till I reached Jonathan Perry's toll-gate. I exchanged a few words with him, and then resumed my journey. Suddenly it flashed upon me that if I was really going to make a strike for it, 
Nothing was to be gained by delaying my flight. What was the use of going home? If I ever got there, I should probably be unable to summon up sufficient resolution to go at all. Just then I heard the sound of horses' feet advancing rapidly down the road. An impulse seized me to get out of the way, but to do this was not easy. There was a shallow ditch along each side of the road, and the fence was too high for a leap. Before I could let down the rails and betake myself to the fields, the horsemen would be on the spot. As I cast rapid glances this way and that, I came in front of the gateway of the lane leading down to the side of Stolliver's house, to his barnyard, and as it happened the gate was open. On came the horse, clattering down the road, and not a second was to be lost if I wished to remain unseen. I rode in, dismounted, shut to the gate, and led my mare a few yards down the lane to an overhanging black cherry, beneath which I ensconced myself. Scarcely had I taken up my position there when the horse and his rider passed at a swift trot down the road. It was too dark for me to tell at that distance who the rider was, but, as you shall hear, I soon found out. I stood still and silent, with my hand on Bess's mane, cogitating what to do next. While I did so, Stolliver's front door opened, and he and his boys walked out to the front fence where the old man lighted his pipe. Then I heard the horse and his rider coming back up the road from the toll gate. In another moment, the rider drew up and began to talk to Stolliver. I listened with breathless attention and heard every word of the conversation which related to myself. I feared that Bess would neigh or paw the ground, in which case the attention of the speakers would have been drawn to my whereabouts. But as my cursed fate would have it, the mare made no demonstration of any kind, and I was completely hidden from view by the darkness and also by the foliage of the cherry tree under which I stood. The horseman, as you probably know, was Lapierre, who had been dispatched by you to bring me home. This proceeding on your part I regarded, in my then frame of mind, in the light of an indignity, a pretty thing, truly, if I was to be treated as though I was unable to take care of myself, and if my own wife was to send people to hunt for me about the neighborhood. I waited in silence till Lapierre had paid his second visit to the toll-gate and ridden off homewards. Still I waited, until old Stolliver and his boys returned into the house. Then I led the mare as softly as I could down the lane and around to the back of the barn, where we were safe from observation. I chuckled with insane glee at having eluded Lapierre and then I was determined on a course of action. Like the egotistical villain I was, I had no more regard for your feelings than if you had been a stick or a stone. You should never suspect that I willfully deserted you, and should be made to believe that I had been murdered. Having formed my plans, I led the mare along the edges of the fields, letting down the fences whenever it was necessary to do so, and putting them carefully up again after passing through. I made my way down past the rear end of John Calder's lot, and so on to the edge of the swamp behind Squire Harrington's. Bess would take no harm there during the night, and would be found safe on the morrow. I removed the bit from her mouth so that she could nibble the grass and left the bridle hanging round her neck, securing it so that she would not be likely to trip or throw herself. I showed far more consideration for her than I did for the wife of my bosom. I removed the saddle so that she could lie down and roll if she felt that way disposed. I took the coat I had used for a pad and carried it a short distance into the swamp, and threw it into a puddle of water. I deliberated whether I should puncture the end of my finger with my jackknife, 
and stained my coat with the blood, but concluded that such a proceeding was unnecessary. I knew that you would be mystified by the coat, as you knew quite well that I had not worn it when I left in the morning. Then I bade farewell to poor Bess, and unaccountable as it may seem to you, I was profoundly touched at parting from her in such a way. I embraced her neck and kissed her on the forehead. As I tore myself away from her, I believe I was within an ace of shedding tears. Yet not a thought of compunction on your account penetrated my selfish soul. I picked my way through the swamp to the fourth concession, and then struck out across unfrequented fields of Harborough Station eight miles away. The moon was up, and the light shone brightly all the way, but I skulked along the borders of the out-of-the-way fields, and did not encounter a human being. As I drew near the station, I secreted myself on the dark side of an old shed, and lay in wait for the first train which might stop there. I did not have to remain more than about a half an hour. A mixed train came along from the west, and as it drew up, I sprang on the platform of the last car but one. To the best of my knowledge, nobody saw me get aboard. I was not asked for my ticket until the train approached Hamilton, when I pretended I had lost it and paid my fare from Dundas, where I professed to have boarded the train. I got off at Hamilton. I waited for the eastbound express, which conveyed me to New York. End of chapter 14. Recording by Bob Sage.